Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Friday, August 19th, and here's some of what we're talking about tonight. The situation in Ukraine is getting much more tense, with fears of a full-blown nuclear disaster. We're probably not looking at another Chernobyl, but what are the risks, and what can be done about them? The legal fights over abortion continue today in Michigan and Arizona. We'll have updates from court. Kobe Bryant's widow testified today in her lawsuit against Los Angeles County. At issue, pictures of the crash scene where he died. Steve Patterson joins us with the latest. Also, the super hot housing market is cooling off. What's behind the drop in sales and what does it mean for the future? And Americans are watching more streaming platforms than cable for the first time ever. We'll explore how these new channels are changing us. A nerve-wracking standoff is happening in Ukraine at the largest nuclear plant in Europe. Bombs have been falling near the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. Ukraine and Russia each accuse the other of doing it. Ukraine says that Russian military vehicles are inside an area connected to the plant and that Vladimir Putin is looking to shut it down. President Vladimir Zelensky is warning of a nuclear disaster. The UN Secretary General says the rising tensions are, in his words, suicidal. Meanwhile, Russia and China are getting ready for a week of joint military drills. The Russian government says it will receive Chinese soldiers for these exercises starting on August 30th. The Chinese government says these drills are not related to the war in Ukraine. As for the United States, it's sending Ukraine another aid package worth nearly $800 million. That includes nearly 1,000 Javelin anti-tank missiles and drones that could target Russian forces. NBC's Phil McCausland has been covering the war in Ukraine and joins us now. Phil, let's start with that aid package. What more should we know about the aid the U.S. is sending Ukraine now? Yeah, there's uh, three really important elements, I think, uh, to talk about. Um, one first is the, uh, the mine aid that they're sending, basically mine clearing equipment and systems that will allow the Ukrainians to move those lines forward I mean, we've been talking about basically a, a World War I type of war um, where those lines are really stiff and tough to move. Clearing those mines will allow Ukraine to move forward. The second really important piece are those drones. Um, they're, they're really, really particularly good for surveillance. Um, when combined with the munitions that they're receiving, including 16 howitzers, um, and artillery rounds, and munitions for their highly effective HIMAR systems the United States has provided previously, the surveillance is kind of the name of the game so that the Ukrainians can match with uh, the Russian strength, um, which has been basically shooting 10 to 1 um, uh, artillery rounds to uh, Ukraine's one. I hate to ask such a, a, a kind of a flattening question, but what is our sense of where the war stands right now? I know it's not as simple as who's up and who's down, but the U.S. has sent a lot of aid to Ukraine. Clearly, it's made an impact. But what's the best assessment in terms of who is, for lack of a better word, winning at the moment? Yeah, I think if you asked that question about a month ago, uh, folks would say Russia. I, I think that has shifted a little bit uh, recently here. Um, Russia has not made the same gains that it had been making um, and has had to take a bit of a step back. I think it's the big help has been that U.S. aid, particularly those long-range HIMAR systems, um, allowing Ukraine to shoot you know, 100 to 200 kilometers We've seen, you know, munition depots uh, on Russian lines, across Russian lines, uh, exploding recently. That's a lot due to um, that aid that's coming from the U.S. Um, although the ones in Crimea, Ukraine has said those are, um, you know, dissidents there, um, Ukrainian special forces, although it could also be weapon systems that we don't know about quite yet. Tell us more about these Chinese and Russian joint military drills. Early in this conflict, China's government, President Xi Jinping and the foreign minister and others kind of tried to be the adults in the room in a way. They, they cast a tone of calm, called for level heads. They must know how these military drills are going to be perceived, which is why the Chinese government said that these are not connected to the war in, U in Ukraine. But what more should we know about them with, with regard to that military relationship? Yeah, I, I think uh, China has, you know, obviously uh, been a, 
unclear about where it stands, although it's still been kind of standing with uh, Russia, has not provided significant military assistance at the, to this point, um, but that appears to be potentially changing here. I mean, I think what's changed, right, is, is a bit of the global dynamic. Um, you know, Speaker Pelosi visiting Taiwan, for example, um, was a bit of a blow across the bow. Um, I think President Xi wants to show um, some strength here, um, you know, facing some domestic pressures. I think uh, President Xi also sees the Ukraine-Russia conflict through his own lens, right, between China and Taiwan. Um, so, you know, seeing Russia fail here could be uh, a bit of a blowback for uh, China and what uh, Xi kind of sees to be his legacy um, in the coming years. We don't have any sense, though, that China is actually going to fight in Ukraine or is going to help arm the Russians, do we? I don't think so. We At, at this point, I, I think this is a bit of a China planting a flag um, right now. Um, but obviously, I mean, if that, that changes, that, that is a, a big particular step that um, could be particularly scary. One last thing. We're going to talk about this plant in Zaporizhia in a moment with our next guest. But I just want to play something from Andrei Yusov, who is a spokesman for the Ministry of Defense's main intelligence directorate of Ukraine. Here's what he said about the situation at the plant yesterday. Listen. There is new information. It arrived about half an hour ago that for tomorrow, August 19th, there is an order for the majority of the station staff not to go to work. This may be evidence that the Russians are preparing for large scale provocations at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant for tomorrow. So we'll talk more about what could happen in a second. We know that the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has been shaking his head over the state of nuclear weapons around the world for pretty much his entire time as the secretary general. What's the latest that we know in terms of what's happening on the ground there? We don't have any word of anything actually popping off at Zaporizhia right now, do we? No, and I mean, thankfully, it's, I mean, August 20th there, um, although, I mean, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean much. But I, I think, I mean, there's two great fears here. I mean, uh, obviously, the nuclear fallout of, of something occurring um, you know, this kind of Russian false flag operation. I mean, some of the models that you see can can really sweep across much of Europe. Um, it's the secondary fear here, I think, as well as the threat of Russia decoupling uh, Europe's largest nuclear plant um, from Europe itself. I mean, this provides power to much of Ukraine, so you could see rolling blackouts, um, but you can also see some real energy pressure added to Europe, which has been struggling for quite a while now with that. Thank you, Phil. That is NBC's Phil McCausland starting us off tonight. Thanks, Joshua. Let's bring in John Earth, Senior Policy Director at the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. He previously served 30 years at the State Department. Mr. Earth, welcome. Good to have you with us. Good to be here. What should the average person know about this plant at Zaporizhia as it relates to what's happening in Ukraine? As uh, has been well documented, it is the largest nuclear plant in Europe. It's the source of about 20% uh, of Ukrainian electricity. It has been occupied since March by the Russian army, and uh, currently there are some dangers that uh, there could be some fighting going on in the area, although it's not clear exactly what is happening. What is your biggest concern right now about what's happening in the area? We had seen some months ago in terms of the fire that broke out near the plant, but in terms of what's happening now, what are you most concerned about? Anytime you have a military conflict in the vicinity of a nuclear plant, it's a very dangerous situation. Uh, it's uh, very irresponsible to be conducting military operations in this area where uh, there is so much radiological material that potentially could get out into the environment. Uh, but that said, I see three main dangers, uh, and it, I, I should say we don't know exactly what is going on. Uh, international monitors have not been able to get access, uh, so part of the problem is the uncertainty and the unknown. Uh, but there are three main dangers. Uh, the first of these is the obvious one, that uh, fighting explosions nearby could damage one of the reactors and result in a release of radiological material. This would be bad for the environment. It could be bigger or smaller, depending on what got out and how bad the damage was. The second danger is that it 
could transpire that the Russians decide that they cannot hold on to the plant, uh, that the Ukrainians are going to take it back, and they could try to destroy it to deny its use to Ukraine. There have been rumors that they're planning for this already. Uh, this is very concerning because destroying the plant would result in a huge catastrophe and potentially a uh, tremendous release of the radioactive material that is inside. Uh, this is something that uh, is consistent with Russian military doctrine. Russian commanders of the past in 1941 and in 1812 are celebrated as heroes for burning and destroying their own land to deny its use to an enemy. So that's a very big concern. Uh, the third concern is, is potentially even more serious, and that is that uh, we've heard reports that Russia is planning to disconnect the Zaporizhia plant from the Ukrainian grid and connect it to the Russian one or to do something else with it. This would deny the electricity to Ukraine, and winter is coming. The potential that... Uh, People in Ukraine who are already cut off from gas supplies would be denied electricity, risks the potential starvation or freezing to death of thousands of uh, civilians. Uh, so in effect, what Russia could be doing is weaponizing winter by doing this. Yeah. So all three of those circumstances, and, and we can see on the map there where Zaporizhia is kind of on the border between the Russian-controlled area of Ukraine, kind of around the southeastern corner, and then the areas that are still controlled by the Ukrainians. So those three scenarios are, are quite dire. We see further up on the map, or we would see if it was marked, Chernobyl. And I think that's kind of what people think of when they think of nuclear disaster. I presume we're not talking about a meltdown, right? Anything of that nature, even though the the three possible scenarios that you said you're concerned about are all quite bad. We're not looking at another Chernobyl, right? Uh, nothing of this would be what happened at Chernobyl, which was an accident uh, coming from human error that resulted in a fire and an explosion and a release of a tremendous amount of radiation. Uh, the key difference would be that this is uh, something that would be done intentionally by having a war near the nuclear plant. And, and not an accident in any way. Uh, and there was one reactor that melted down at Chernobyl. There are six at Zaporizhia. Uh, there are more modern, they're safer facilities. Uh, so the danger theoretically should be less. But uh, when you're talking about the dangers of a nuclear plant exploding, it's not something to be taken lightly. For sure, for sure. I don't want to let you go without talking about possible solutions or paths forward. I'm guessing that the options are few, considering we're talking about a war zone and, and even trying to get a kind of a no-fire, ceasefire area around the plant has not really proven uh, fruitful so far. But what options are there to try to prevent disaster from happening? And, and do you see any of those options as viable? But the, the first thing that should be remembered is that we are in this situation because Russia chose to invade its neighbor. Uh, and we continue to be in it because Russia continues to illegally occupy that part of Ukraine. Uh, so if you're talking about a solution, part of it has to be getting Russia to uh, abandon, to, to get out of what doesn't belong to Russia. Uh, part of the way you do this is through continued economic and diplomatic pressure you do it through making sure that everybody understands in the world what the serious consequences could be, and that whenever Russia has a contact with anybody else in the world, this comes up. Hey, you guys are doing the wrong thing here. Get out. Do not cause a nuclear catastrophe that would affect not just Ukraine and Russia, but potentially a dozen other countries. Uh, so the, the message has got to be consistent, it's got to be clear, and it's got to come from all corners. And for people here stateside who may look at this still as that kind of crisis over there, you know, we are months into this war, and there's a lot of things that the American people have to think about. Are there any impacts, any unintended consequences that this could have on us further west if this spins out of control? But clearly it would make what is a, already a, a dire humanitarian situation even worse. Uh, you're talking about uh, already uh, thousands, if not millions, of displaced persons. Uh, you're talking about uh, whole towns and villages that have been destroyed. If you add to that another uh, huge catastrophe, it's getting to be more than the system can bear. 
so the effects would be felt well outside of Ukraine and Russia uh, and uh, would uh, impact most of the rest of the world. John Earth of the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation, I appreciate you making time for us. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Still to come, how are the Ukrainian people doing right now? We'll show you how some folks there are rebuilding their lives as best they can. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. Millions of people have fled the war in Ukraine. And Russia's invasion seems to have no end in sight. But Ukraine's teens and 20-somethings are giving people hope. They're part of a volunteer group called Repair Together. These young adults are working through the wreckage of this war, cleaning up homes that were bombed out. NBC's Josh Letterman has their story. It's early on a Sunday morning in Ivanivka, but a group of young Ukrainians is already awake, ready to work. In a village devastated by Russian artillery, 69-year-old Olya Lazarenko is waiting for them. This used to be your, your kitchen. Mm -hmm. In what's left of the home she and her husband built 45 years ago. She says, I cried all day yesterday because everything is lost. There's nothing left. But now a new kind of army is fighting in Ukraine. Not to tear down, but to build up what's been lost. It's called Repair Together, a band of teenagers and 20-somethings finding their own way to fight for their country's future. The group says more than 1,500 Ukrainians have stepped up in cities across Ukraine, mostly connecting through Instagram. At some events, the cleanups turn into a rave, with DJs spinning techno. Irina Lialik came to Ivanivka from Lviv, more than 400 miles away, in the relative safety of Western Ukraine. I really needed to help somehow, and uh, donating money is nice, I do that, but it doesn't fill in out. So I wanted to come here and do something with my bare hands. Seeing the hope and optimism as these Ukrainians clean up and rebuild, you could almost forget that there's a war still raging. But there are reminders here that this war is far from over. As Darina Tischenko works in the summer sun, her thoughts are in southern Ukraine, where two months ago her dad was serving in the special forces. He exploded uh, on the mine, yeah, and uh, yeah, no one survived that operation. And for me, being here, it's also to continue uh, his uh, ideas, his beliefs. He put himself at risk because he yeah. wanted yeah. to do this work. Ukraine's government says at least 140,000 homes have been destroyed in this war so far, leaving three and a half million people homeless. Like Olya and her husband Grigory, now living with neighbors, their grandson fighting on the front lines. But amid the grief and piles of dusty rubble, there is still hope in Ukraine. She says, I can only thank them so much for coming here and helping us. My husband and I wouldn't be able to do anything here by ourselves. We don't want to wait to the end of the war and then start rebuilding. Even if, God forbid, this house gets attacked another time, I will come here another time and rebuild it twice. That was NBC's Josh Letterman reporting. We will get to some of today's other top stories in just a moment, including military women pushing for abortion care through the VA, Vanessa Bryant's emotional testimony in court today over Kobe Bryant's death, and a ruling on Florida's Stop Woke Act that compares this law to Stranger Things. The fates of some very old abortion bans are being decided in courts across the country. Today in Michigan, a judge ruled that prosecutors cannot enforce a law from 1931. The judge called it dangerous and chilling. Women and all persons capable of caring children not having the ability and freedom to consult with their medical professionals without fear of prosecution puts the government into the patient examining room. A person carrying a child has the right to bodily autonomy and integrity, as well as a safe doctor-patient relationship free from government interference, as they have been able to do so for nearly 50 years. The ban is blocked for now. The judge added that Michiganders should decide on abortion at the polls. 
Meanwhile, an Arizona judge is considering an abortion ban that's more than a century old. The law only allows abortions to save the pregnant person's life. It was blocked in 1973 with Roe v. Wade. The judge says she will rule on this next month. An abortion ban in Texas has been on the books since before the Civil War. That has prompted some tough conversations inside health care systems, including veterans' hospitals. NBC's Julie Serkin has more on that. Hey, Julie. Yeah, Joshua, our team got exclusive access to join with the House Veterans Affairs Committee on a listening tour across Texas to hear directly from women veterans about their personal experiences with the VA. Watch. You're a woman. I don't know what to do with you. That's what Navy veteran Tana Plesher says a VA doctor told her when she sought care for a panic attack. And for the largest population of women veterans nationwide, Texas's abortion restrictions spotlight the existing gender disparities within the VA medical system, as some of them told Congresswoman Julia Brownlee during a listening session on reproductive rights within the veteran community. We spend our whole career assimilating into a, a male world. Why should we have to assimilate into male health care? Before the birth of her daughter, Army veteran Amber Davila says she had multiple miscarriages requiring several surgeries that may be illegal today. In 2016, Amber turned to the San Antonio VA for severe pain in her stomach and back. At that time, she says, the clinic had one gynecologist and a single ultrasound machine. Some clinics don't even have that. A 2020 Inspector General report found the biggest VA hospital in Texas went several years without a gynecologist and had inadequate women's facilities. The service that I received was naproxen and toughen up. This spring, the 37-year-old had enough. She paid out of pocket to see a regular doctor who immediately scheduled an emergency hysterectomy. I suffered for four years with cyclical pain. I had no choice. The only treatment was to remove my uterus and my cervix. I had to have a full hysterectomy. So I have one child <laughs> and I don't have the opportunity to have other children. Other veterans recounted similar experiences. The VA does not provide any abortion services, adding to growing concerns among military women. NBC News was denied multiple requests for interviews by the VA, including access to their medical center here in Houston. Instead, they provided NBC with a statement saying approximately 300,000 women veterans of childbearing age rely on us for their health care, including services such as contraception, fertility care and maternity care. And we will continue to make sure that they have timely access to the full suite of reproductive care. Why is the VA not doing any women's health care for for um, abortion. Why, why is that not happening? Congresswoman Brownlee is hearing from women demanding better medical infrastructure that is specific to their needs, especially in states where abortion is banned. Democratic lawmakers say the VA can expand services under existing law. The secretary has the authority to make that whole change. He could do it tomorrow if he wanted to. Unlike the VA, the Department of Defense provides abortion services on military bases, where nearly one in four women say they were sexually harassed. But most don't report it, according to a study from the nonpartisan Rand Corporation. Lucy Delgadio says she was raped while serving in the military in the early 1990s. My eldest is the product of my assault. Lucy says she, not her abuser, was discharged after becoming pregnant. The military calling her unfit to serve. She lost her benefits, she says, experiencing homelessness while her mental health deteriorated, not only from military service, but from the assault, too. We raised our right hand so we should get the services that we rightly deserve. And that's all we expect. We want to get the services that our male counterparts get when they go to the VA. Women are the fastest growing cohort in the veteran community. But there is worry among some of them that abortion regulations on top of existing health care issues among women will further impact recruitment. This is fuel to the fire. What do you want people to know about women veterans, especially with these restrictions in place? We stood side by side, shoulder to shoulder. When we served, there wasn't a problem. I was the most visible service member, and now I'm the most invisible veteran. Why? Why is that? 
and we pressed the VA why they don't expand services to include abortion care today, as you heard one woman there, Angela, asking Congresswoman Brownlee, uh, but they did not reply. Still, these women say they're going to continue sharing their stories, however personal and painful to retell, in hopes that the VA will change their policies. Joshua. All right. Thank you, Julie. That's NBC's Julie Serkin reporting. A federal judge in Florida is blocking parts of a state education law as unconstitutional. Yesterday, the judge ruled on the Stop Wrongs to Our Kids and Employees Act, the Stop Woke Act. Governor Ron DeSantis was a champion of this law. It restricts conversations about race and discrimination in schools and businesses. The law faces a number of lawsuits. This ruling addressed a suit filed by a honeymoon registry company. It argued that the Stop Woke Act would prevent it from holding employee seminars and trainings. Judge Mark Walker ruled that the law violates the First Amendment. In his ruling, he referenced a hit TV show, quote, now, like the heroine in Stranger Things, this court is once again asked to pull Florida back from the upside down, unquote. The governor's office is expected to appeal the ruling. Today, a fourth police officer was fired over the death of Breonna Taylor. Sergeant Kyle Meany's firing comes two weeks after a federal grand jury indicted him. He and three other officers were charged with civil rights violations and other charges, including lying on a search warrant. Back in March of 2020, Louisville police officers knocked down Breonna Taylor's door while executing that warrant. Her boyfriend fired a shot at them, thinking that someone was breaking in. Attorneys say he was licensed to carry a gun. All of the officers were in plain clothes. They fired more than 30 shots in all. Ms. Taylor was struck a half dozen times. In Los Angeles, the widow of NBA superstar Kobe Bryant was back in court today. Vanessa Bryant is suing L.A. County officials. At issue are photos taken of her late husband and their daughter at the helicopter crash that killed them. Ms. Bryant said the photos caused her emotional distress and constitute invasion of privacy and negligence. She testified that she lives in fear of those photos becoming public. NBC Steve Patterson joins us now with more. Steve, tell us more about what we heard from Vanessa Bryant in court today. A very emotional day in court, Joshua, from the reporters that are in there, cameras obviously not allowed, but what we heard was just heart-rending testimony from Vanessa Bryant, who took the stand, uh, sobbing through a lot of that testimony, a few hours, in fact, uh, sobbing so hard, in fact, uh, allegedly, that she was almost convulsing, that her body was moving, that she had to take several breaks to gasp for air. Um, she's alleging a few things, one, widespread misconduct within L.A. County, within the fire department, within the sheriff's department that were on scene the day of that crash that she says uh, took several pictures that they should never have, that they were not evidentiary or training purposes, as some deputies and officials have alleged, that they were essentially these visual souvenirs that first responders took away of her family. They shouldn't have been taken. They certainly shouldn't have been shared, according to her as well, shared between themselves, shared at public spaces, shared with with the public, including the alleged uh, incident of a bartender seeing one of those pictures. Um, and finally, you know, just that she is felt emotionally devastated by this, by not only the knowledge that these photos could be released at some point, that they could end up on some gossip website or, you know, at some point like that, uh, but also that there was essentially the heart of this, that there was a broken promise from the sheriff who spoke to her moments after she learned about her husband and her daughter dying in that crash and was reassured that something like this wouldn't happen. And she was so worried about the paparazzi, and now she's suing L.A. County in light of all this. Uh, testimony expected to continue uh, next week. Back to you. How is L.A. County responding to this? Are they denying that this ever happened? Are they justifying the photos as someone else? What's their defense? Uh, so the fact is these photos were taken. They don't deny that whatsoever. In fact, in testimony, the uh, deputies and the fire officials that were on scene admit to taking those photos. They admit to sharing those photos. Their defense, the core of their defense, is in the fact that they say the administration that was overseeing this took quick action to try to squash those photos from ever appearing in the public, that there was disciplinary action, that there was administrative action, that they moved quickly to try 
to reassure the victims that the families wouldn't be, you know, affected by the photos being released, that they're not in danger of being released, that the evidence uh, in that case, the photos were deleted shortly after, uh, and that any emotional distress that Vanessa Bryant or the families are feeling couldn't be from the release of the photos because in the two and a half years since the crash, we haven't really seen a photo end up online. We haven't really seen it end up in the public's hands. That's their argument. So they're trying to attach this distress to the fact that the crash happened. And we saw in cross-examination today, their attorneys going after Vanessa Bryant by talking about the fact that she's now taken over several companies in Kobe's name that she seems to be high functioning uh, and that, you know, she seems to be handling this fine. That's their argument uh, as far as where they are, Josh. What is Ms. Bryant asking for from L.A. County? I mean, other than not having these photos be public, is she asking for money? Is she asking for, uh, a, you know, a flash drive with the files? What kind of restitution does she want? Well, first, she's hoping that the flash drive with the files doesn't exist at all. I mean, that's the primary hope, that if there is any sort of evidence or, you know, any trace of these photos in existence somewhere on some hard drive, uh, that first, it doesn't exist, that, but that secondly, it never sees the light of day. Uh, she's in a lawsuit with a fellow family friend, Chris Chester, who also lost a wife and a daughter in that crash as well. Uh, they're suing for, you know, unspecified amounts of money. You know, obviously, likely damages in the millions, but that's not really the core of what they're doing. I think they're seeking justice by way of really putting a black mark on L.A. County for allowing this to happen, by sharing their story in court, by relating that story to the jury, by letting the public know their side of the story and where they feel the truth is. I think really that is the core and the heart of what they're doing. Josh. Before I let you go, Steve, this is a little bit more of a, an intangible question, but what's the conversation around L.A. been like regarding this case? I mean, I'm sure Laker Nation would much rather be talking about LeBron James being re-signed than talking about the ongoing aftermath of this horrible crash that killed Kobe Bryant. But what's the, what's the public sentiment been like around all this? Kobe Bryant is probably one of the biggest, brightest figures in Los Angeles history. You can now see murals all around the city, pretty much everywhere you look, on every corner. This discussion really has never dropped about the, the just the emotional impact of that day and what everybody experienced together. Uh, and I think the fact that she learned you know, about what happened with Kobe through the department. She learned what happened with the department about them taking pictures and disseminating that information the same way that I learned it, the same way that you learned it, the same way that everybody in this city learned it from an L.A. Times article. So I think there has been this indignation, this, this fe feeling of, uh, you know, how could this happen? And I don't think that feeling has ever stopped alongside this trial. It is something that is closely watched. I think the people here want some sense of justice or closure, just like she wants a sense of justice or closure, because they feel that tied to the story, that figure, that family, and what happened on that day, Josh. Yeah, how could you not when it comes to Kobe Bryant? Well, we will see how the trial proceeds next week and in the weeks to come. Thank you, Steve. That's NBC Steve Patterson with the latest on this trial from Los Angeles. Up next, we'll check in on the housing market. Sales are at one of their slowest paces in years. Is that good for the economy or bad for the economy? We'll get behind the numbers just ahead. Stay close. For the last few years, the housing market has been all over the place. Sales surged in the beginning of the pandemic, but that trend may be over. According to the National Association of Realtors, sales of previously owned homes fell by nearly 6% from June to July. Sales are down about 20% from last year. Joining us now is Daryl Fairweather, chief economist at Redfin. Ms. Fairweather, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. What's behind this dip in home sales? Is this something that seemed inevitable, that we kind of expected, or is there more to it? It's really a result of higher mortgage rates. When mortgage rates went up from around 3% to above 5% and made buying a home much more expensive, especially in places where homes are already really pricey. These higher mortgage rates could add thousands of dollars of expense a month in a place like Los Angeles or San Francisco, and those markets have definitely suffered because of it. 
you said that mortgage rates have gone up. Is the, we've heard a lot lately about the Federal Reserve raising interest rates. Is this connected to that, or is there something else going on? Yes, when the Federal Reserve raised interest rates, it made borrowing to buy just about anything more expensive, whether it was a car or a home. Now, mortgages, they're on a bit longer of a horizon than how the Fed sets interest rates. For mortgages, it's over a decades-long span that people are holding these mortgages. So it's not just about where interest rates are now. It's about where people expect mortgage rates to be in the future. And overall, it looks like it's going to be more expensive to borrow. And also, because of inflation, lenders need more money back in the future to make up for that devalued dollar that gets eaten away at by inflation. Are there certain parts of the country where home sales are down the most? Are we talking mostly about the most expensive markets, like your New Yorks, your San Francisco's, your Los Angeles's, or is it the markets that had been the hottest that have now cooled down a lot? It's those markets that had been the hottest. So Boise, for example, was extremely popular during the pandemic. It was one of those migration destinations for people getting away from the city, looking for some more space. And now that's cooled off a lot just because of how hot it was before. But markets that are typically more slow and steady, like markets in the Midwest, are still looking pretty strong. Could we also just clarify, just so I know how to look at this, this report, does it mean that home sales are down or that they've just leveled off? Where there were some markets that were like, like you said, go, go, go during the pandemic and people were moving and relocating because it was less expensive. And now they just kind of returned to earth as opposed to dropped to a level where it would cause concern. Which, which are we talking about? Home sales are down. Home sales are down from last year, but last year was a really, really hot market. Those low mortgage rates brought out a lot of buyers. Now buyers are backing off, but sellers are backing off too because they're sitting on record equity. They've locked in low mortgage rates, so they don't see a really good reason to sell into a soft market either. So it's kind of like a standstill when it comes to home sales. Prices, on the other hand, those are pretty stable because with less demand and less supply, prices remain high. I think what you just said might dovetail into something that the chief economist for the realtors said. They said that we're in a housing recession because builders are not building, but homeowners are still very comfortable. Get into that a little bit. Explain that if you would. Well, homeowners gained record equity last year, and homeowners also borrowed at a time when, when it was really hard to borrow compared to during the 2008 recession. These homeowners have really good credit reports. They're likely to be employed. They have lots of equity, which means they're not in a position where they have to sell in a distressed manner. If they don't want to sell, they just don't have to sell. If we were to enter into a more severe recession where people start to lose their jobs and people can't make their mortgage payments anymore, then that would be more worrisome. But for now, homeowners, they're just taking a pause on the market the same way buyers are. So this is a good market for people who want to sell, maybe not quite so good for people who want to buy? Compared to last year, it's definitely harder to sell now. Homes are sitting on the market longer, fewer homes are getting bidding wars. On the buyer side, that's a bit of a good thing. You don't face as much competition, but that borrowing expense is higher. The advice I would give to buyers, though, is that you can always change your mortgage rate later. You can refinance, but home prices are probably going to keep climbing, in, if not this year, then in future years. So it's always a good idea to get into the housing market when it's a good time for you, especially if you're planning on staying in the home for at least five years. How do you see this affecting people's ability to buy homes in the longer term future? I mean, there are a lot of, I think, Gen X, Gen Zers and millennials who have kind of said, like, this is, this is stupid. Like, why would I even think about buying a home? It is positively impossible economically to do what my parents did, definitely can't do what my grandparents did. And they're contemplating, you know, communal living situations and renting and every other kind of living other than buying a home and dropping equity into a permanent residence. What does this mean longer term for people who are like, the home homeownership is a thing of the past. Whether somebody who's young decides to be a homeowner or rent, they should still plan for a future where housing gets more expensive. 
So if you buy a home, at least you can lock in your mortgage payment, you have the price of the home set, your expenses aren't going to go up. But if you're renting, you're kind of at the will of the market and rents are going up a lot right now. They're up 13% from last year. They're probably going to keep climbing year after year. So if you do plan to keep renting, just be prepared to have your rent increase. Now you can plan for that. You can save money. You can invest in the stock market and still get a good return and save for your retirement. But I think it just takes a little bit more planning than the traditional route of buying a home. And briefly, before I let you go, what do you think we should be keeping an eye out for next? Are there any particular economic factors or indicators, anything that you think will be affecting the prices of homes or the market for home buying in the near future? So the latest inflation data shows inflation leveling off, which means that the Fed should start to slow down when it comes to tightening monetary policy. Now, that should mean that mortgage rates fall, which could lead to more demand in the housing market. But what I'm really paying attention to is what the Fed does next. Are they going to react to this softer inflation data by being softer themselves? Or are they going to take a hard line and wait to see more months of inflation turning down? What they do will, be, will impact the trajectory of not only the economy, but also the housing market. Daryl Fairweather of Redfin, appreciate you explaining this to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perhaps you're watching me on a television, but not through a cable box. The odds of that are higher now than ever. More Americans are cutting the cord from cable. We'll make some meaning of all this streaming before we go. Peacock, Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, YouTube, even a good old-fashioned website. You're probably watching NBC News Now through one of those streaming platforms, and you are far from alone. For the first time, more people are streaming than watching cable TV. That's according to Nielsen's Gage Report, documenting viewership in July. This is a big shift from how we watched TV last year. Nielsen says that in 2021, about 28% of America's TV watching was on streaming services. That's more than over-the-air broadcasts, but well behind cable. Those are the bars in yellow. But since last year, going to the bars in blue, streaming is up six and a half percentage points. Broadcast is down more than two points. Cable's off more than three. So what's in store for next year and beyond? Let's get into that with Joe Flint, media and entertainment reporter, for the Wall Street Journal. Mr. Flint, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. What do you make of this shift? I presume that it comes to this as, as a surprise to absolutely no one. Exactly. I mean, we've all been seeing the trends for the last few years as, as consumers cut the cord, as you said, and migrate to new platforms and start streaming more. So this, this is been expected, much like the way when cable surpassed broadcast TV for the first time. Uh, yeah, nonetheless, even though we all knew this was coming, it is still a big deal. It might have even had come sooner if last summer we didn't have the Olympics, which certainly you know, gave summer viewership for cable and broadcast a boost. What do you think is behind the success of these streaming services? Granted, the leaders are still kind of leading. Netflix is still at the top in terms of overall streaming with about 8% of consumers. YouTube's at about 7.3%. Hulu's at 3.6% and then on down from there. Is it that the streaming services are doing something specifically right? Or are they just kind of where the public is going and they happen to be catching the audiences as they shift? I think it's both those things. You know, we see Netflix, we see Disney+, Plus, we see HBO Max, Hulu, others, with a lot of compelling original shows. And... People can watch a lot of those shows on their timeline. I mean, you know, with the Netflix and the binge model, and Hulu does some of that. HBO Max still does more of a traditional broadcast cable type model. But there's a lot of content there, and not just new stuff, but a lot of old uh, library shows. So it just becomes almost a place to graze, if you will, content versus the traditional linear TV of the broadcast and cable networks which more and more find most of their audiences from 
big live events, uh, sports, news, that sort of stuff. I think it's also worth looking at this from the business's point of view. I mean, NBC News Now is not an experiment for NBC News, right? We are a major bet in the future of, of the news division. But I think it's fair to say that a lot of companies are kind of running around with the hair on fire. They don't know what the future's going to be like. And they're trying things and throwing things against the wall. And there feels like the, it feels like there's a lot of volatility in terms of what Wall Street wants. The same amount of profit with a very different media landscape. And no one has quite figured out the formula yet. How does that factor into what the streaming landscape looks like? Just Wall Street saying, you're going to make the same amount of profit, right? Exactly. I mean, we saw what happened to Netflix stock earlier this year when they underdelivered by a hair their subscriber projections in the first quarter. And then they forecast under delivering again in the second quarter. And and they did. And you know, they've been beaten up for it. And we're seeing concern about subscriber growth and streaming across the board. At the same time, we all recognize that this is the way content is headed. But there's economic models in the traditional TV world that are much better right now at collecting revenue. I just did a story today about ESPN. And a lot of people talk about whether Disney should spin off ESPN because it's, it's a melting ice cube. And it is a melting ice cube, but that ice cube still provides a lot of water to the rest of the Disney company. And the money it makes helps to generate the content they need for the other street for their streaming services, which aren't making any money. So that's the challenge as we see this transition and Wall Street will have to learn to be patient. Here's what I'm not sure that a lot of companies fully understand. I feel like there is this search in Wall Street to find the app to rule them all. And they're not going to find that because we like to have variety. And we fe it feels like we're almost walking to a different version of the same complaint of cable, right? Where people are like, why do I have to pay all this money for channels that I don't watch? And then you end up getting Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime and Peacock Premium and on and on and on. And then you end up with a suite of services that cost you the same thing you paid for cable plus the cost of internet service. It doesn't feel like any of this is quite figured out. How long is it going to take before we get this to a place where consumers are comfortable with it and companies feel like the profits are working? Well, I, I think to your point, there's a little bit of a, a wake-up call because, right, initially it was streaming's great. I'll pay for what I want to watch, and I don't have to pay for these other channels that I don't watch. But you know, now we're at a point where we're seeing some companies like Google's uh, YouTube and Walmart trying to cut deals to with these programmers to offer a bundle. There's you know the B word again, the dreaded bundle, uh, so that consumers don't have to go you know manage six different services and they can get them all in one place. And that part makes sense. But to your point, that's not necessarily going to lower the costs. And all these streamers are operating under the theory that we need more and more and more original programming. So they're spending heavy, heavier and heavier on it. And that also means they're not really going to be able to lower the cost. We saw Netflix raise their costs earlier this year. Disney Plus just raised theirs. Uh, HBO Max uh, wouldn't be surprised if down the road theirs go up a little once they bundle their service with Discovery. So that's going to be the challenge. And as usual, the consumer gets stuck with the bill. Before I have to let you go, does cable stand a chance in this streaming future? I, I saw a tweet from a friend of mine who was furious that HBO Max took a bunch of episodes of Sesame Street off. And CNBC has reported that viewership for kids programming on HBO Max hasn't been as strong as they thought. I bet if you had your cable system, Comcast Spectrum, whatever, you could find it in video on demand no matter what. Is cable dead or might it still stand a chance before we go? I think cable subscriber numbers will level off. I mean, right now, say ESPN, there are like 73 million homes and it's been a steady decline. But a lot of analysts think when we get to about the 50 million range, it will level off. I want to just say one thing about Sesame Street before I go. HBO Max has been dropping a lot of shows. The truth of the matter is they're doing this for financial reasons and, and tax reasons as much as anything else. The removing, uh, killing the Batgirl movie, taking shows off HBO Max so that they can get a... Uh, tax write-off on them. A lot of this is being financially motivated by the parent of HBO, Warner Brothers Discovery, which needs to find ways to cut costs to deal with a very high debt load.
Yeah, John Oliver had a very snarky comment for his new bosses yes. at Warner Discovery in last week's Last Week Tonight. Yes. Joe Flint of The Wall Street Journal, appreciate you making time for us, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, your weekend can begin. You can always send us thoughts and questions on anything we cover. We're at NBC Now Tonight on social media. Leave us a brief but brilliant voicemail, 888-575-2NBC, or email us nowtonight at NBCNews.com. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. However you stream us, thank you for making time for us. And we will see you on Monday. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.